what was the Catholic and Orthodox controversy about giving St. Peter the name The Rock and also like giving him the keys? Because this is, uh, this is, it keeps getting brought up time after time. Oh yeah, um, there are some of the Holy Fathers, including St. John Chrysostom, who say this, it refers to the faith of Peter, that the rock is the faith, the confession that Peter made, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And on that rock is the church built. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. The choir of the saints has found the fountain of life and the door of paradise. May I also find the way through repentance. I am the sheep that was lost. Call me up to you, O Savior, and save me. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Steadfast Godcast. My name is Chris Go, and my guest today is the author of The Church and the Pope, Robert Spencer. Robert, welcome to the channel, mate. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Mate, thank you very much for coming on. Um, how you been? Oh, good. Uh Thank God. Lots of good things going on. Very busy. Just finished a book about the Byzantine Empire that'll be out next year that uh, I hope that a lot of people will find interesting. We'll see. Awesome. Um, look, I've been watching you for a few years now and uh, mostly uh, in your channel, you know, Jihad Watch and doing shows with David Ward and talking about Islam and, and all that sort of stuff. But look, I've got to be honest, uh, you know, a few months back, I saw an ad um, on Father Peter Ezra's um, YouTube channel. And it was like, I saw, I saw, and it said like the, the church and the Pope. And I'm like, okay, and by Robert Spencer. And I was like, what? I had no idea that you were Orthodox. Um, I actually thought you were Protestant, but uh, yeah, it was, it was know, pretty crazy. I, uh, in my public work, talk about Islam, not Christianity. Haven't really spoken about my own faith until this book comes out. And so uh, there's really a lot of people, actually, I see that still on Twitter. A lot of people say, well, see, even this evangelical Christian Spencer says this, and yeah. <laughs> well, and I thought, you know what, what, how great would it be if I can get Robert Spencer on the channel? And I reached out. You're so gracious, and uh, thank you so much for um, for taking time out of your busy schedule. Oh, um, I know you. that we, where you were sick at one point, and then this happened, that happened. But you know, God's timing is perfect. So uh, thank you once again. Thank you. Uh, but before we start, do you mind if you lead us into prayer, please, Robert? Yeah, I actually uh, have from the, from uh, this little prayer book here, the uh, Prayer for Enlightenment from the uh, morning Bible study. And I thought even though it's uh, not morning, well, it's morning somewhere. And uh, there is, well, you'll see why I chose this. In any case, uh, Having received this new day as a gift, I thank you, Holy Trinity, for through your goodness and patience, you were not wrathful with me, an idler and sinner, neither have you cast me down in my sins, but you have shown your love towards me and have guided me to keep my daily watch and to glorify your power. Enlighten my mind to study your word and open my heart to understand your teachings in scripture. Help me to apply what I learn and to praise you with all my heart and to glorify your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit now and forever on that uh, so All i thought right. about enlightenment there and understanding the word of god would be pertinent to our discussion at this point beautiful beautiful my god bless this session god bless us uh thank you very much for that robert but uh today look we're going to be talking about uh, your testimony which i find pretty interesting by the way um and your book the church and the pope so we might start with your testimony um so i mean for you as a, as a young uh, young boy what was your Christian upbringing like? I uh, didn't have much of a Christian upbringing at all. Uh, my parents were, uh, my mother was Orthodox. My father was Presbyterian. They sometimes went to the Episcopal Church as kind of compromise, middle ground of some kind between the two. Uh, I went along sometimes and uh, many times we didn't go anywhere. And I remember asking my father when I was five years old about uh, if there was a God and 
what was God like and what was this all about? And he said, this is something that uh, we're going to let you make up your mind when you grow up about. So that was that. <laughs> and so I had very little uh, instruction in the Christian faith. Then actually I was, uh, I was, I should also note that I was baptized Orthodox and uh, always found the divine liturgy to be entrancing, to be completely involving, but didn't understand really what was going on. Of course, it was in Greek. And uh, my father said, I don't want my son learning any language I don't speak because my mother and grandparents would always be talking in Greek around the house. And this drove him crazy. He didn't like that at all because he knew they were talking about, <laughs> about him. Um, <laughs> I always knew when they were talking about me, although I didn't know what they were saying because they would say, oh, Micros, the little one. And I knew that was me as opposed to my big brother. Anyway, um, <laughs> the, uh, in college, I actually did go through a uh, born again phase, Protestant evangelical, uh, went to a Bible church and all that. And um, ultimately, however, this was in, in God's providence leading me back to the church because in the first place, it gave me a very strong Christian commitment that persisted. In the second place, it uh, confused me because when you've just got sola scriptura people, you're going to run into controversies between them. And I did this in particular, this is around 1980, 81, about um, the charismatic gifts, you know, speaking in tongues and all that. There were some people that I knew who said, you have to speak in tongues or you're not a real Christian. And other people I knew who said, if you get into this tongue speaking business, that's from Satan. And you will have, you will make shipwreck of your faith and lose your soul. So uh, you can't get more more of a dichotomy than that and i had no idea where to turn and uh, actually a very kindly episcopal priest who used to walk through campus he would uh, wear his clerical collar and just take a walk through the campus every day several times a day i would see him all the time passing by and he was doing that actually as a as a christian witness as an outreach to the students trying to remind them that there was more than college life in the world and beyond the world. In any case, uh, he told me that for the questions like that, you look to the tradition of the church. And I thought, oh yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I kind of remember that from before. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that was how I ended up leaving. Ultimately, that set me on a trajectory that I realized I had to be in an apostolic church uh, and ultimately because of various factors ended up joining the catholic church and becoming a melkite greek catholic which is the corresponding church to the greek orthodox and they're not greeks but they have the liturgies they have the icons they did you could in some of them you could think you're in an orthodox church and it was there for many years but ultimately um along about 2015 began to have well actually 2012 or 13 began to have difficulties with various hierarchs over my work regarding islam because they thought that it was you know <laughs> harming the dialogue and so on and people say oh he left the church because of islam that's not the case i uh didn't leave until 2017 there's actually a misprint in the book that's caused some controversy because it says there's a typo right at the beginning. You know, uh, I love the Father Peter and the Uncut Mountain Press, but they don't have a huge editorial staff. And anyway, some typos got through. Uh, and it says 2015, it was 2017 when I left. But in any case, uh, it was the controversies that I had with some of the bishops that made me start to think, especially because one of, uh catholic uh, uh monsignor actually that i debated on the on the radio said that what i was saying was actively heretical and i was actually a dissenter from the 
magisterium of the church. Anyway, I started to think about questions of authority and what was the nature of authority in the church? Who has the authority in the church? What are our obligations toward that authority? At what point might we uh, disagree with them? And at what point must we accept what they say and so on? Anyway, these considerations led me to return to where I started from. And so here I am. Here I am. Well, that's it. Uh, but I mean, you were saying before about the, the Malachite Greek Catholic Church. I mean, yeah. you're saying it's very similar, you know, Eastern uh, uh, rituals and icons. Um, but what is the difference between the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek uh, Malachite uh, Catholic Church. Well, you know, a lot of people don't even know these churches exist. The Eastern Catholic Churches are about 1% of the Catholic Church worldwide, uh, very, very small groups. And actually, they come from a tremendously uncharitable effort on the part of the Pope of Rome uh, when the various reunion attempts failed the Council of Lyon, the Council of Florence, uh, and others that weren't didn't result in um, Catholic councils. The uh, Jesuits actually started to send missionaries over to try to convert bishops. And those who don't know, those who don't know who were the Jesuits, just a little bit. Yeah, the <laughs> Jesuits are uh, the Society of Jesus. It's a very famous group within the Catholic Church uh, religious order. I believe the Pope Pope Francis is a Jesuit, if I'm not mistaken, um, and they are very powerful very influential. A lot of things are said about them, not all of them true, but uh, they have been, they, they were very, very powerful and influential in the church at the time of the Counter-Reformation. And it was at that time that they began to go into Orthodox areas and uh, set up churches that were just like the churches that were already there. And this was kind of unprecedented. You know, the Orthodox never said, even when they were saying that the Pope of Rome had fallen into schism and heresy, never said that that that, that was a, there should be another bishop of Rome, and set up a, a a parallel hierarchy. But the Catholics did this, and these Eastern Catholic churches still exist. They have the Orthodox liturgy to varying degrees. There was a lot of Latinization, and then there was a reaction against the Latinization. And so you find in, in Melkite Greek Catholic churches in the United States, some of them follow a lot of Catholic practices. Some of them you would not know they're not an Orthodox church until you're in halfway through the liturgy and they pray for the Pope of Rome. Um, but otherwise, it seems like an Orthodox church. The spirituality, it's the same thing. It's kind of a hybrid. Uh, the Eastern Catholics tend to think of themselves as a bridge, a the church breathing with both lungs, the unity that we ought to have. But what they really are is kind of neither fish nor fowl. Um, they have no identity of their own. And they are not really sure, even at the highest levels, whether they're Catholic or Orthodox or to what extent they should be either one. And so I found that I couldn't even after I became a Catholic, I became a Catholic from reading books and they were old books too. And so I went into the mass of the, the Roman Catholic church and I thought, this is not what I joined. This is not what I thought I was joining. This is not this even the same church. It doesn't, it's changed so much, which of course should have been an alarm right there. But in any case, I found the, uh, the Eastern Catholics, and I thought, well, at least here I can pray, here I can worship. It's not a circus. There aren't midget motorcycle riders dancing around the altar or whatever. Yeah. It's not all this liturgical craziness. And so it's great. But yeah. they don't really have a, a, as I said, they don't really have an identity of their own. And they're not really sure what they are uh, because the Romans. The Roman Church throughout history has always Latinized all the churches in communion with it. And so there's a tendency toward that and then a tendency to reject that. But then to what extent can you reject that and then say you're really a church in communion with Rome and so on? I mean, of course they are. They are wholly owned and operated subsidiaries of the Church of Rome. But uh, 
practically there are a lot of people who just like to pretend that's not even the case they would like to be orthodox but for whatever reasons for their family or whatever they prefer to stay in the catholic church and so they go to these places was there was there like a definitive moment or what was it that made you you know go back to to orthodoxy of the fullness of the faith so to speak well i found that actually just what i wrote in the book the book actually i wrote in order to get all this clear in my own mind there's a a novelist the american novelist jd salinger who wrote the catcher in the rye very famous book he once people asked him somebody asked him how do you get an idea for a book to write and he says i write the book that i want to read that doesn't exist (laughs) so i was wondering what some of these uh issues were and decided to go back and read what the holy fathers said and started to write it all down and uh, there it is the primary thing that led me back was in the first place a very strong understanding of the difference in quality between the Roman Catholic Mass and the divine liturgies of St. John Chrysostom and St. Basil uh, from experience, knowing that there was an incomparable richness in the Orthodox worship that was not the, the, certainly gone out of, if it was ever in, the Catholic worship. And so I've been able, by God's grace, to maintain that within the Catholic Church, which most people cannot. But as it happened, I moved to a place where there was a Melkite church quite close by, and it's still there. And uh, so that was, of course, one thing that I thought, well, now I, I, I realize that the, the Pope was not the Pope, as we understand the Pope today, in the first millennium. So. There's no reason why I shouldn't go back. The primary consideration, though, was just that, that the authority in the church, and that was what I was investigating. Well, I mean, your relationship with your family and friends since returning back to the Orthodox Church, has it changed? Is it the same? Is it? Oh, yes, yeah, changed quite a bit. It's <laughs> uh, It's been kind of interesting. Um, there are some people who don't care, of course, and there are some people who are very upset and worried about my soul and i appreciate that because if they pray for me i i'm grateful um and in any case uh that was another reason actually why i wrote the book i'd forgotten this until just now but uh had a very interesting strange incident uh this is some years back in, I think it was in 17, right when I had gone, come back, gone back to the church, the, uh, there was this man who contacted me. I didn't know him. I actually thought that he wanted an interview. I thought he was a journalist. But as it turned out, what he told me um, was that he was working on a thesis that had to do with the Muslim Brotherhood. And could he talk to me about that? And, you know, I I said, sure. And uh, we set a time. And it turned out, I told him some things about the Muslim Brotherhood. And he didn't even seem interested and didn't seem to know anything about it. I thought, you're writing a big paper at this, uh, I think it was some Anyway, I I don't want to get too specific, because I don't want to cause the man any trouble. But the, (laughs) the point is, he didn't seem to know or care about what he actually asked me to talk about. And he steered the conversation to the church and tried to get me to return to the church. And uh, so I I thought, well, you know, people are asking, people are wondering what on earth happened. So I wrote this in large part to have something to be able to explain. And so I sent him one, uh, I offered to send him one, excuse me. I think he uh, 
politely declined, but in any case. <laughs> um, so, you know, what would be your advice to a Catholic who's not sure about the papacy, you know, all the things we hear about today with the Pope, and he's looking into orthodoxy. Uh, any advice there for them if they're not, you know, they're sort of on the fence, not sure they've been a Catholic all their life? I don't know. Something that's similar to... Uh, my advice would be, come on in. The water's fine. <laughs> uh, my advice would be, look into it. Pray about it. Study. Don't just accept what you've always been told as axiomatic. It may be that some of those things are false assumptions and a lot of people i, I had a, a very close friend say you know whatever you're saying it all just amounts to subordinates not wanting to take orders from the boss and so i think that's how a lot of catholics think about the great schism and the orthodox but have they ever really considered if the pope really ever was the boss in that way and ever had that kind of authority to assert over Constantinople and over the other patriarchates in the East. And you, you look into it, you don't find it. It's not there. And you also find a lot of extraordinary anomalies. I'm getting into the content of the book now, but um, very briefly to take, for example, and these are things that Catholics are familiar with if they're knowledgeable about these issues, but I don't think they have an adequate explanation. Take, for example, the Council of Chalcedon, where Pope Leo the Great wrote the tome, an explanation of the natures of Christ that was accepted by the Council as, as a, an authentic statement of the faith. And Catholics often point to this and say, see, there's, there's, there's the, the, the fathers are crying out, Peter has spoken through Leo. And so this cinches our argument. But they gloss over the fact that the same fathers examined Pope Leo's document and determined that it was orthodox. They did not receive it as the statement of orthodoxy from the Holy Father, like nowadays they would. If there were an ecumenical council today and Francis wrote something about a dogma of the faith, it would be inconceivable, it would be heretical per the Catholic Church for the bishops at the council to examine the statement for orthodoxy, even though Pope Francis is quite obviously not orthodox. Not I don't yeah, mean, yeah. I don't mean no, no. small o. Mean, small yeah. o orthodox. Yeah. So they they would be inconceivable, and that indicates that there's been a very large change in the understanding of the role of the papacy in the church. And that the understanding that prevails today and based on Vatican I and Vatican II is not the understanding in the time that the that the fathers had, and not the understanding of the Church of the First Millennium. Well, since you've gone to the book, we'll uh, we might as well delve into into it. Look, I've read the book. I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm learning about church history myself. I don't know everything. I don't claim to know everything. Um, but this isn't to bash Catholics. I mean, we love our Catholic brothers and sisters. We really do. I have family on my wife's side who are Catholic, some really close mates who are Catholic. So may the Lord have mercy on us all because all we try to do is stay, um, you know, to we just want the truth. That's all really. That's all we really want. And uh, whatever that leads us. But uh, it looks like, uh, you know, the orthodoxy, or at least we feel like orthodoxy is the fullness of the faith. So um, I know you dabbled with it before a little bit, but what what inspired you to write the book? Well, yeah, uh, trying to get it all clear in my own mind, trying to make it clear to people I knew and still know, uh, and to see what kind of a case could be made. Like Salinger said, yeah, I wanted to read it, so I had to write it. And I love that. So That's pretty good. The uh, and to see as I went through the records of the seven councils, the statements of various fathers, to see if there was disconfirming material. And you know, there's this there's a Catholic apologist who's very upset with the book, and he also <laughs> says it's a terrible book, but he's clearly. It bothers him because he keeps making videos about it. And uh, even though I'm the worst apologist in the entire world, he says. And anyway, he <laughs> pointed out 
yeah, I would mm-hmm. think if I'm the worst, then why keep making the videos? But anyway, <laughs> um, he pointed out some statements of popes from ecumenical councils that I don't deal with in the book. And they assert all these things about the role of Peter, the succession from Peter in the Church of Rome, the how the, the Church of Rome has always kept the faith pure and undefiled and so on and so on. And he doesn't make the distinction, however, that yes, the papal legates wrote, said these things, read them out, but what the councils decided is not what anybody just says in the council. The council is the canons that come from the council and any dogmatic statements that come from the council. It's not just any random statement by somebody that was there. And the obvious rejoinder to the idea that these things were accepted in the early church, when you take specifically, I'm referring to Pope Agatho at the Sixth Ecumenical Council in 680. And he makes a statement, he wasn't there, his legates make a statement that, uh, uh, like of all this papal authority that I was just saying. And so this guy was saying, see, there it is, it's in the council. But it's very clear the council didn't accept it because the very same council condemned. Pope Honorius, one of the predecessors of Pope Agatho, as a heretic. So obviously they didn't think the Roman church has always preserved the faith pure and undefiled and never made an error and so on. So in any case, uh, I was hoping to clear up issues of that kind and also to bring a different perspective because a lot of times these kinds of things are just these kinds of discussions descend into just proof texting and people just quote something like that statement of Agatho and say, see, there it is. And I wanted to come at it from what impressed me in looking through these things that I thought might be of some interest to some others, that what is the difference between what we see in all these records and, uh, the papacy today. Not only the things I just explained about Chalcedon, but you take, for example, Pope Victor in the second century, and he excommunicates the churches of Asia because he doesn't like their date for Easter. And he wants everybody to have the same date for Easter. We're still, we're still not, still haven't gotten that figured out. And uh, Eusebius, the church historian, says in the fourth century that a lot of the bishops didn't like what he did and they sharply rebuked Victor. And I've seen Catholic apologists say, my old pal Patrick Madrid and others that, um, look, he nobody said he couldn't do it. Nobody said, hey, you don't have the authority to do that. Uh, but, well, that may be. But I was thinking, okay, well then can you give me an example of any instance in the last two centuries, say, the, the last three centuries. So we have Vatican I in 1870 and Vatican II in the 1960s. Can you give me an example from the 1800s or the 1900s or now where any bishops sharply rebuked the Pope? It doesn't happen. Yeah, that's right. You know, there were a lot of people, there were a lot of bishops who didn't like the definition of infallibility at Vatican I, but they didn't stand up and sharply rebuke Pius IX, they left without voting and hoped that he wouldn't bother them. And then he came and forced them all one by one to submit. And the Melkite bishop, as, as if I recall correctly, um, man, I haven't thought about this in years, but the Melkite bishop, I can't remember his name, the Melkite patriarch, I'm sorry, he, uh, what the, I don't remember his name. But if I'm, I, I, I could be mistaken, I could be misremembering, so pardon me if I am, but I believe that the Melkite Patriarch, Patriarch of Antioch, was uh, one of the ones who didn't want the definition of infallibility. And he was summoned to Rome and went to kiss the Pope's foot, and the Pope put his foot on his head and said, uh, Malatesta, uh, hardhead, um, you know, because he wouldn't accept it and he submitted, and you know, that's a, that's, that's total monarchy. That's absolute power. And, and that's a world away from the bishops not liking what Victor did and sharply rebuking him. 
you know, the, the, the Melkite patriarch wasn't sharply rebuked. He had the Pope's foot on his head. Well, look, since you've been in both camps, you know, Catholicism and Orthodoxy, can you be trusted to report on like papal infallibility or papal supremacy? Uh, I would say no. No, I can't. <laughs> and that's why I quote and give references so that everybody can check on me. Um, in all seriousness, I do my best to be accurate. And uh, constantly in my work on Islam, constantly, I mean, practically every day, because see, I have a news website. And so jihadwatch.org, I report on jihad activity every day. And every day, there's somebody on Twitter comes along and says, you're lying. This is a lie. This is fake. And every day I give the source or I say, well, where exactly was the lie? And they never can come up with anything that's an actual lie because I'm not lying. And so I'm only saying, I'm saying it facetiously or semi facetiously that I can't be trusted, but yeah, don't trust me. Check up, check all the references and look for yourself. And you'll see that the book is accurate and that the characterizations of the interactions of the various popes and bishops and everybody that's in the book, that's all accurate. And then draw the conclusions. Well, on a little side note there, I actually watch uh, Jihad Watch with uh, David Wood every week with you and him. It's pretty cool. <laughs> actually enjoy watching it. Um, but look, what was uh, what was the Catholic and Orthodox controversy about giving St. Peter the name The Rock? And also, like giving him the keys, because this is uh, this is it keeps getting brought up time after time. Oh yeah, um, and all, um, everything all, everything we're going to be talking about now is obviously snippets and stuff from the book. So yeah. you can obviously, guys, whoever's you know watching, you know it's it's more um, there's a lot more information than what we're going to be talking about today in the book. But um, yeah, what was that um, giving him the keys and naming him the Rock? The uh, well, this is of course the passage from Matthew chapter 16. And there are some of the Holy Fathers, including St. John Chrysostom, who say this, it refers to the faith of Peter, that the rock is the faith, the confession that Peter made, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And on that rock is the church built. There are others, or, or more in contemporary Catholicism, they say that the rock was specifically Peter himself, and that consequently the Pope of Rome is the rock of the church upon which the faith depends. And so that's why you have the idea of infallibility. Uh, and I mean, of course, the Orthodox understand the church is infallible. It's just not located in one guy. And in the Catholic church, it is. Uh, but there are many holy fathers who say that what was said to Peter in Matthew 16 applies to all the apostles and hence to all the bishops. There are some who give the impression that all bishops are in a certain sense successors of St. Peter. Uh, certainly, we historically, the Antioch, as well as Rome, was founded by Saint Peter. Saint uh, Mark founded the See of Alexandria in Egypt, and he was, of course, a disciple of Peter. So you have successors of Peter's and Peter in three places. That also causes trouble for Catholic apologists, although they generally tend to say, "Well, Peter died in Rome, so therefore it's the." Uh, it's the Bishop of Rome who's the successor of Peter par excellence and gets the infallibility and the primacy and the universal jurisdiction and all that. But that's actually, I mean, where is that? Yeah. In, 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 that's not in Matthew or in the uh, New Testament or in the Apostolic Fathers or any of the Fathers that there's some special succession conferred by being the last, being the place where you die as opposed to a sea that you founded. You know, the, the successor of Peter is uh, the Bishop of Antioch, the patriarch, the various patriarchs of Antioch are the successors of Peter. So why don't they have the infallibility and the universal jurisdiction and everything if it was given to Peter as a person? You see how it runs into a problem there because 
if these things if it's true that the confession of faith in matthew 16 refers to peter as a person and then is conferred upon his successors well then it ought to be in antioch and alexandria as well and, and you you also have uh you know uh peter and paul when they have that discussion about uh uh, should we be circumcised or not and, and whatnot? You know, if it was, if that was the way it was, I'm pretty sure that Peter was, um, you know, for circumcision to keep the, uh, the Jewish yeah. law there. So and he if says, that was the Peter case. Came to Antioch. I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Imagine yeah. saying that. Imagine a, a, a Catholic bishop saying when Pope Francis came to New York or wherever, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. It, it, it couldn't happen. Yeah. No chance. Look, do, do we see any like pre Nicene fathers, like, you know, St. Ignatius, uh, Irenaeus, St. Polycarp, acknowledging any papal supremacy like we see today no. at the Vatican? And that also is very important. Ignatius of Antioch is a disciple of St. John. He learned from St. John. So St. John the Apostle apparently didn't tell him anything about papal primacy that's so sent such a central doctrine to the Catholic faith. So you, you have St. Ignatius of Antioch writing his letters and he says the bishop in every diocese is like Christ. And it would seem like if there were a Pope, if there were a single authority over the whole church, a single earthly authority over the whole church, then wouldn't that be the one that he would analogize to the Lord and say, the Pope in Rome, he's like Christ mm. in the church. But he's saying every individual bishop is like Christ in the church. And that's extraordinarily important because here's somebody who learned from an apostle and he has no clue. There's no indication. You know, people make a lot of, I believe he says, uh, is it St. Ignatius of Antioch? who says that the, the church of rome holds the first place in love i believe it is or am i mixing him up with uh Irenaeus? i can't recall to be honest yeah, in any case, if he's, it, it, which one of them said that so it's second century and what does that mean it, you, you have some catholic apologists who will pour the entire doctrine of the papacy into that but he he just uh he, he might be referring to the fact that it's the capital city of the empire at yeah. that time and that uh so the bishop of rome is an important bishop and maybe he was a very loving fellow maybe he just meant uh, you're you're a more loving guy this is one more loving church actually because he's not talking about the pope he's talking about the church you you people in rome are the nicest people ever you know we don't really know what he meant yeah. by that but there is no indication of him ever saying uh of saint ignatius saint irenaeus justin martyr polycarp polycarp actually remember he has a discussion with pope anicetus and they agree to disagree about the date of easter they agree to disagree he didn't yeah. just accept what the holy father told him and see here yeah. again we're just not breathing the same air as the Catholic Church breathes today. And it's just not the same organization, same structure. You know, I'll give you another example, actually, uh, if you don't pardon me for going on so long. But no, 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 no. Of these things keep occurring to me. Um, this is actually not in the book. This is in the next book, the Byzantine Empire book because I just wrote this history of the Byzantine Empire. And so obviously this is the Orthodox Empire. It, there's a lot of the material about the church in it. And I had never looked very closely at the councils of Lyon, at the Council of Lyon. I had actually studied Florence back in college, but uh, the Council of Lyon in 1274 was an attempt to reunite the churches. And it was because the, uh, the emperor, Michael VIII Paleologos, was in very big trouble. <laughs> he was the one who reconquered Constantinople after the Crusaders had sacked Constantinople and destroyed the empire, and they had a Latin emperor in Constantinople. So Michael VIII recaptures the city, but he's still facing threats from the Crusaders. Meanwhile, he's also got the threats from the Turks. And so he figures he's got no choice 
but to rec re reunite with the Church of Rome. And then the Pope will tell the Crusaders, hey, knock it off. You can't fight them. They're not schismatics anymore. And he writes to the Pope and he says, let's have an ecumenical council and reunite. And the Pope says, okay, but before the council starts, you have to get the ecumenical patriarch and all the bishops in the East to accept the primacy of the Pope, the filioque, all the things that divide the churches. Then we'll have the council. I was, right, I was right. reading that, and I put it in, in my book, of course. I was amazed, because I thought, here again, 1274, and it's just not the same church as the Church of the Fathers. Because the Holy Fathers, when they had the ecumenical councils, Nicaea, Constantinople, Ephesus, Chalcedon, and the others, they didn't settle everything first based on what the Pope said and then go in and ratify it. They hashed it all out at the council and prayed for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they made the decisions. So it seems to me, I'm going to write about this, um, send it to the uh, Uncut Mountain Press blog. Uh, I hope they'll put it up, but I've had to write it first. But in any case... <laughs> saying that here again we have a a, a, a a meeting that the catholic church considers to be an ecumenical council and it's simply not operating the same way as the ecumenical councils of that are accepted by both catholics and orthodox and the this papal monarchy and papal dictatorship and and uh authoritarianism is is very much present there and simply wasn't there before well, you were saying as well, you're talking about Council of Nicaea, uh, Canon 6 is uh, the only, well, there's only one that mentions the authority of the Bishop of Rome. But does it show the supremacy of the Pope? That's, yeah, the, that's no, the thing. That's worth looking at. It says here, let the ancient customs in Egypt, Libya, and Pentapolis prevail, that the Bishop of Alexandria have jurisdiction in all these since the like is customary for the bishop of rome also that's it that's that's the only mention of the bishop of rome so what they're saying is what's happening there is that the patriarchates are developing that you have these bishops in the big cities of the empire and they are being recognized as having jurisdiction over the surrounding cities and their bishops so the Bishop of Rome has this, they say, and now we'll do the same thing for Alexandria. Okay, but wait a minute. Isn't the Bishop of Rome supposed to be having a jurisdiction over the whole church? Yeah, and so true. why are they talking about having Alexandria now can have jurisdiction over Egypt and these other areas, just like Rome does in its area? Well, why does Rome have an area? The whole world should be Rome's area. If the if what the Catholic Church teaches today were the faith at the Council of Nicaea, but obviously it isn't. And also in the in the Byzantine Empire book that I just wrote, and I'm sorry to keep mentioning this because it doesn't even exist <laughs> yet. I've written it, but it won't be published for many months. But in any case, uh, the there's a lot of, at the time of St. Photios in the ninth century, there's a lot of disagreement, a lot of jockeying, between Rome and Constantinople over jurisdiction over Bulgaria. And why, uh, I think this is completely opaque, completely incomprehensible to a modern Catholic who thinks, why should he be jockeying? Why should there be competition between these two patriarchs over jurisdiction? The Pope has jurisdiction over everywhere. So why are they fighting over Bulgaria? But obviously, the understanding in the in the first millennium was that the patriarchates had various jurisdictions. There was not one that had jurisdiction over all the others. And so the question was, does Bulgaria fall within the jurisdiction of Rome or of Constantinople? And that makes perfect sense in light of Orthodox ecclesiology, but is completely incomprehensible in light of Catholic ecclesiology. 
Well, in uh, St. John Chrysostom's uh, homily on St. Paul's epistle to the Romans, mm -hmm. who did St. John Chrysostom consider the Roman see to be? The uh, see of Peter and Paul. And the reason why that matters is because Pope Innocent X, quite a bit later, said it's a uh, very bad, very heretical, uh, I'm not quoting him, obviously, but in any case, he, he ruled out saying that that was the see of Peter and Paul. So you can't say that. It's it's all Peter. And yet you you read the fathers, you read uh, what St. John Chrysostom says, it's Peter and Paul all the time for Rome. He says, when the, when the cherubim sing the glory, where the seraphim are flying, there we shall see Paul with Peter and as chief and leader of the choir of the saints. So uh, Pope Innocent X, obviously, and St. John Chrysostom, here again, they don't have the same understanding of the church. Why not? Yeah. Uh, at, the, at the Council of Ephesus as well in 431, uh, we had uh, Nestorius, the Patriarch of Constantinople, who taught the heresy uh, that Christ only had one nature, which was born uh, both divine and human. But Pope Celestine, Celestine, I hope I got that right. Um, uh, yeah, had... I, I don't know. You know, people say these names in various different ways. I mean, I noticed that you said Chrysostom, and we say Chrysostom in America. And Although actually the Roman Catholics say Chrysostom in America. The Orthodox say Chrysostom. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I learned, I think that... Uh, I studied him a bit in college, and I, I we called him Chelestin, but okay. Well, no. Well, maybe my Aussie accent doesn't help, does it? <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so Pope uh, Celestin had uh, condemned Nestorius, but yeah. if the Pope had authority as he has today, then why wasn't that the end of the matter? Exactly, and there again at Ephesus, just like at Chalcedon twenty years later, yeah. the bishops examined the statement of the Pope. They didn't just take it as uh, gospel, so to speak. They didn't just say the Pope, uh, uh, what is it that uh, Augustine said? It's wrenched out of context and he didn't, clearly didn't mean what the uh, what the Catholic apologists say he me me meant, but he said, Roma locuta causa finita. Rome has spoken, the matter is over. It's The case is closed. It's done. And they didn't think that at Ephesus or at Chalcedon. The Rome spoke and they said, is this Orthodox? They examined it, they determined it was Orthodox, and then said, okay, this is the, the faith. This doesn't make any sense in light of the ecclesiology of Vatican I and Vatican II. It, it's absolutely incomprehensible. It's even heretical that they would question the infallible dogmatic definition of the Holy Father. Well, look, uh, you know, I mean, I think my outtake as an Orthodox Christian, when I look at the, you know, the apostles, the church fathers, the Bible, you know, the councils, even though I haven't read and seen everything, so I could be ignorant, but I, I, I really don't see, you know, the papal infallibility or the papal supremacy. You see Rome as definitely a respected, um, you know, very respect, respected, but not, I don't see it as that sort of just, yeah, that supremacy, infallible, the way that they portray themselves. But, you know, um, anyway, that's that's just my take on it. I think, I think the, the book is is fantastic. Um, a funny story about the book, though. I've actually got uh, two copies, two copies of the book. I purchased it on, I purchased it on Amazon and uh, I got an email back saying that, uh, look, you haven't paid for it yet. So I said, okay, no worries. It must be a mistake. I'll pay for it. And uh, it turned out that I paid for the book twice. So there you go. <laughs> well, now you can give one to a friend. Well, no. So what I was thinking about doing as well is probably giving one away on, on the channel or I'll do a little, oh, little prize cool. or whatever it is. Excellent. Yeah, so we'll definitely have one giveaway of the book, courtesy of me, Robert, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. I only no have problem. Uh, I'm still uh, waiting for the 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 uh, author copies i shouldn't say that I'm, i don't mean to put you guys on the spot <laughs> Wait, and i love you and but uh but look i'll definitely i'll definitely give it to an australian subscriber um 
uh, one of my subs. So yeah, so we'll definitely do something like that. But look, there's so much more information um, about all those topics that we talked about today. Right. Let's and, say and, UK and see, I I don't know. I I'm I'm just a dumb American. I thought you were speaking like an Englishman, but you're Australian. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, uh, I will be going to Speaker's Corner one day, hopefully, but no, no, I'm yeah, just... <laughs> great. Remember, I was, I was speaking years ago in Australia, and there was an Englishman who was also speaking. And one day, I couldn't believe it. I'm standing there, and all the Australians are repeating things that he said and laughing. And I said, what on earth are you laughing about? And they said his accent, the way he speaks, and I thought it, he sounds just like you. <laughs> <laughs> they could they, they they could hear a big difference. Oh, there is there definitely is a difference, yeah. But uh, but yeah, no. Look, thank you again. Um, look, Robert, that's gonna do us. Robert, that's gonna do us for the episode for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Definitely gonna have you back on in the future. Probably talk about uh, you know the critical Quran or <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, or yeah. also as well your new book that's coming out as well um look i'll put all your details in the description box but how can people find you how can people support you and where they can purchase the book and obviously the, the new book that's coming out just give us a little brief uh, overview there yeah thank you very much uh in the first place this book little this little book is uh available now from uncut mountain press you can go straight to the uncut mountain press website or you can find it on amazon and the uh, there's also a link on my book page at my website jihadwatch.org along with links to all the other books and uh um what else did you say jihad watch rs on twitter you can see me asking people to explain where i've lied and they never can <laughs> and so that can be entertaining and uh what else the book, the uh, I hope they will call it How the Byzantines Saved Civilization. I want to assure those who know that while Byzantine will be in the title, throughout the book I call the Byzantines what they call themselves, Romans, and explain that this is just the Roman Empire in Constantinople. And that is a full uh, history of the Roman Empire in Constantinople. It's going to be a pretty large book, I think about 450 or 500 pages. And I just finished it. I got to send it in in another couple of weeks, but I'm going to think, see if I think of anything else to add. In any case, that will be out in the fall, God willing, uh, from Bombardier Books and will be available on Amazon and wherever self respecting books are sold. All right. So we'll put everything uh, in the description box. Once again, Robert, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, joining me here on the on the uh, on my channel, um, and guys, please don't forget to subscribe on the YouTube page, and please like us on our Facebook page. And if you want to support the channel, um, the link is in the description box where you can buy me a coffee. Uh, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. My Lord and my God, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. <laughs>